We are going to start friction today, and we're going to focus in this course on dry friction, as opposed to fluid friction, internal friction, or rolling friction. And you can read in the textbook about uh, some, some comments about some of those things and other courses you might have opportunity to, to address those. But in dry friction, we have two surfaces that are in contact. They're either sliding or getting ready to slide, and we call that tending to slide or impending motion. Impending motion is the word our book uses for getting ready to slip. So the force of friction is always opposite of actual motion or impending motion, and it resists that motion. The force of friction is a reaction force. In other words, it resists motion. If you pull this way, the force of friction is going to be in the opposite direction. It's going to be tangent to the point of the contact surface. So in other words, if the contact surface is this way, it's going to be tangent to that. If it's slipping, the force of friction will be equal to mu normal, where mu is equal to the static coefficient of friction if it is not moving, or the kinetic coefficient of friction if it is actually slipping at the time. Where mu, again, is the coefficient of friction, the normal force is perpendicular to the surface of contact. The force of friction maximum is independent of the surface area. It doesn't matter how many contact points you have. In Coulomb friction, which we'll be addressing in this course, we're going to assume that they're all one, one contact as long as they all have the same coefficient of friction. So the force of friction is just P, or the pulling force, up until the point that it begins to slip. Just look at this graph here. If you have the force of friction on this line and the pulling force on this line, they're going to be equal to each other up until the time that they begin to slip. At this point in time, the force of friction generally drops down because the kinetic coefficient of friction is generally less than the static coefficient of friction. And But up until the time of slip, the force of friction is just equal to the pulling force. It is only maximum when it is slipping or is just getting ready to slip. And remember, the force of friction can never be more than mu normal. Kinetic friction shows that it is generally less than static, static friction. In other words, the coefficient of static friction is generally greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction, and you can see here on this graph. Also, uh, mu, or kinetic, uh, the coefficient of friction, is a property of the two surfaces and two materials. It is not a single material property. And you can look at this table in our book. It is not a single material thing. You can't just say the coefficient of wood, coefficient of friction of wood, or the coefficient of friction of steel. It is always two surfaces in contact with each other, like steel and ice, wood on wood, etc. So there are many types of friction problems, and we're going to try to put all the ones we consider into these three general types. The first one where is no motion occurring at all. In other words, the friction is sufficient to keep it in place. For example, if we have this little A-frame and we got some forces cooling down, we got some normal forces, there is friction here to keep it in place. But if it's not moving, the force of friction is not mu normal. It is just a reaction. It is going to be less than mu normal. Second type of problem is where all surfaces are slipping or, get, or, or impending slip. For example, this board or a ladder leaning against a wall. Both surfaces would move. And that means that um, all surfaces would be maximum friction or mu normal. And that's usually some sort of a rigid body or perhaps two bodies that move together. The third category is impending motion on some points of contact. In other words, not all of them. So in, for example, here we have the same A-frame. Perhaps if I pull it here, it might slip here, but not slip here. And that's some, uh, something we'll have to analyze. Boxes, things like that, usually have just one point of contact. That's pretty easy to, to see. If you have two distinct contact points, you can still use just one normal force unless the points have different coefficients of friction. Now, for a car, you might have one, one set of wheels freely rolling and the other set of wheels with friction like a brake applied. So in that case, you would, uh, you would have different coefficients of friction. However, if the both brakes were on and both the uh, coefficients of the frictions of the tires were uh, were the same then you could just use it you basically just treat it like like a box 
The friction angle is something that's pretty uh, handy and, and pretty important, and we can quickly analyze some things, understanding that at slip, the angle at which it slip is related to the coefficient of friction by this term. Mu is equal to the tangent of the angle. We call the friction angle, the angle at which everything begins to slip, we call that phi. So if we're looking for the friction angle and we know the coefficient of friction, we can just take the inverse tan. So you can look at this free body diagram and look at this set of equations, but if we rotate the axes into x prime and y prime, and I generally don't refer to them as x prime and y prime, I'm just going to call them x and y, but so don't get confused about that if, uh, if you see the uh, see x and y like that. But if you sum the forces in the x is equal to zero, you've got an mg sine theta going down the hill, uh, force of friction going up the hill. If you sum the forces in the y direction, you have a mg cosine theta and a normal force. Both of those are equal to zero. At slip, we know that the force of friction is equal to mu normal. And then solving this for mu, you can see that the mg's cancel sine over cosine is equal to the tangent. Now, I just glossed over the mg cosine and mg sine concept, but you should remember from what we did in chapter 3 or 5, I can't remember, well, one of those earlier chapters where we talked about how the, uh, how the incline plane analysis works. But basically, the get the pencil mode here. If you have a body, it's going to have an angle going down the hill or a, a force going down the hill. The mg is always going to be perpendicular, but there's going to be a, a component of mg going down the hill and into the hill. And what we said was that the angle that the incline mixed with horizontal is the same, that the, uh, same angle that normal makes with vertical. So in this case, this this force here is normal, which means that the inside force or that inside angle is going to be the same as the angle theta here. So I'm going to just go write angle theta here, which means that this is going to be mg cosine theta, and this is mg sine theta. Normal force is always going to be going into the hill, and uh, well, I'll just draw it here, but so the normal force is going to be like that. All right, first problem we're going to tackle is a tipping or slipping problem. What happens when I push on this box? Will it tip or will it slip? And you have some, some, uh, some numbers here. It says that the, uh, the uh, crate weighs 250 pounds. We've got a coefficient of friction. So the first thing we're going to do is draw a free body diagram, and we're going to assume that it is impending slip, and then we're going to solve. Assume a point of rotation. This is a solve for the slipping condition. Then we're going to assume a point of rotation, and we're going to assume impending rotation, meaning impending tipping. And then we're going to compare the answers. And only one condition will be valid. So we'll see what, uh, what we come up with. Remember that in other tipping problems, just like the stability, all the weight at, uh, at the point of rotation is, uh, is concentrated at that point of rotation. And remember we talked about if it rotates at A, then B goes to zero. So first of all, let's draw the free body diagram of the slipping condition. So that's pretty simple. We're just gonna draw a box. I have a pushing force, I have an MG, and a normal force. Now, if it's going to slip, then the force of friction is gonna be going backwards. And at slip, we can say that the force of friction is equal to mu normal, which is nice. So let's, uh, let's sum the forces in the y and see what we get. Sum of the forces in the y is equal to zero. In this case, minus mg plus normal force is equal to zero. So n is equal to mg, which is equal to 250 pounds. Summing the forces in the x is equal to zero, we have the pushing force minus the friction force is equal to zero. And again, friction force, P minus the force of friction, in this case, it is uh, 0.4, which is force of friction is going to be mu normal, which is 0.4 times 250. Oops, 250 is equal to zero. So P to make this thing slip is 100 pounds. Okay, pretty straightforward like that. All right, how about tipping? What happens at tip? Well, let's move this up just a little bit. 
under the tip condition, we have a very similar free body diagram. I still am going to be pushing, but here I got some lever arms to take care of. At P, or I mean at tip, it's going to rotate about A, and whatever happened at B here is going to go to zero. Okay? So all we have to do then, we still have a normal force, so I'll go ahead and put that, but the normal is going to be concentrated there at A. It will also have a friction force. However, we don't really have to worry about the friction force because we're going to sum the moments about the point of rotation. And at that point, both normal and the force of friction go through that point of rotation. So let's just write tip. At tip, it is rotates at A and B goes to zero. So we're going to sum the moments about the point of rotation. Well, what have I got? Minus P times the lever arm of 4.5 plus MG, and it's got a lever arm of, let me get back here, of 1.5, and that's equal to zero. All right. I can zoom in just a little bit here and finish this. Minus P times 4.5. The MG is 250 pounds times 1.5 equal to zero, so I can solve this for P is equal to 83.3 pounds. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Um, those are, that's a typical uh, exam problem. Well, actually, probably a little bit easier than I'd give for an exam, but uh, it's a concept that uh, we will be testing on, and that is, does it tip or does it slip?